The title of today's sermon today is Jesus, Our Joy. And again, today we're going to look at why we can be so joyful as we commemorate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to begin by uh, playing a, a little video from GCI. were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. favor rests. From uh, Luke 2, 14, and um, I'll read it. It's from the uh, ESV. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. These are the words of our Lord. Praise be to God. Amen. You know, there seems to be a lot of controversy about the celebration of Christmas. And um, some see it that it has pagan roots. And others argue that it's impossible to prove the day when Jesus was born, whether it was December 25th or not. And the meaning of Christmas is from a Latin root, uh, and it simply means Christ is sent. And it's a very appropriate name, isn't it? Christ is sent. So as we celebrate Christmas in our minds, we can ask one of two questions. We can ask more, but <laughs> we can ask one of these ones. That's what we will cover during today's sermon. We can ask what do we celebrate at Christmas? What do we celebrate at Christmas? Or we can ask, who do we celebrate at Christmas? Because the way we approach and think about it makes all the difference. It really makes all the difference. 
And if we were to ask people on the street why they celebrate Christmas, I guess we would have a variety of answers and a multiplicity of answers. Um, and because people, whether they're Christians or not, in North America, in our Western culture, celebrate Christmas. You can go to France, you can go to Hungary, you can go to the United States, you can go to Canada, you can go to Mexico, you can go everywhere, and, and people celebrate Christmas in our Western culture. And people will say, well, you know, it's a great time to give gifts to other people, to people we love. And that feels good to be able to give to others. Uh, others may say, well, it's a time to reunite families and loved ones. And a lot of times there are great hopes that relationship will be healed at Christmas, especially when there are maybe difficulties in relationships. Other people may say, well, it's a great time to have a break just before winter begins. And others say, see it, well, it's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a holiday, so why not benefit from it? It's a great time to have a little vacation, and, and it's tradition, so we celebrate it. But if you were to, to ask, well, what is Christmas all about? Many would have a hard time, and they would answer these various questions. But as God's people, I think we have to look at the who we are celebrating. Because when we look at the who we are celebrating, it tends to cut through all the false arguments of why we ought not to celebrate Christmas. And so, um, so today we will look at the who and why Jesus is such a great joy. Why Jesus is such a great joy. You'll remember back in 2013 on July 22nd when Alexander, when George Alexander Louis was born, He's the son of Prince William and his wife Kate. And David Cameron said the following when he, when he expressed his, his joy at the, the birth of, of, of this young prince. He said, um, it's an important moment in the life of our nation. And I suppose, above all, it's a wonderful moment for a warm and loving couple who, go, who, who got a brand new baby boy. It's been a remarkable few years for our royal family, a royal wedding that captures people's hearts. The, that extraordinary and magnificent jubilee and now this royal birth all from a family that have given this nation so much incredible service, and they can know that a proud nation is celebrating with a very proud and happy, and happy couple tonight. And so people not only in England celebrated, but really people all across the Western world celebrated, and in Australia, in Canada, Everywhere, there was great expectations about the birth of this young boy. It wasn't there. And it was covered on television. It was covered in the newspapers. There was all kinds of pictures taken. And they really had to fight for their privacy, didn't they, as they as at the birth of this child. When, when Jesus was born, there was an announcement and there was rejoicing, but the rejoicing was mostly not on the earth. The rejoicing was mostly in heaven. Because the angels knew God. They knew Jesus. They knew how good God is. And when they came to announce to a few people, the shepherds and the magi, that a king was born, they just sang and praised God because they were excited. They were excited about the birth of, of God, the coming of God as a human being to this earth. A wonderful, wonderful celebration. And, and Jesus came as we read that he would be a blessing 
to the nation. And as we read the Bible, we know that he is a blessing to both the Jews and the Gentiles. He came to take away the sin of the world. He came to, to, so that we could have life as human beings because otherwise we had no hope. Otherwise we would have died in the ground and just had gone, would have gone back there. That would have been the end of us. And Jesus came to the earth actually to give us life. To give us life. Life right now and life for eternity. So, you know, the, when they celebrated the birth of the son of, of Prince uh, William and, and Kate, you know, they did not ask where he was born. That was not the important thing. What was important is that they celebrated the birth of a boy. They celebrated the who. And as we, as God's people, we are celebrating the who when we celebrate Christmas. That is, that is who we celebrate as we commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ that has, and his birth, his coming to the earth, has changed the destiny of humanity in a very tangible way. It was in God's plan from eternity, but when Jesus came, the actual plan of giving life to humanity was initiated. And it's something to celebrate once we understand how this loving God works and has his intention for us. And the angels sang because they they, had, they knew about the prophecies that God has in, inspired through the various prophets and what he had inspired, for example, through the prophet Isaiah. Uh, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. This is a prophecy given to Isaiah way before Jesus was ever born. And he said, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy for her people to be with gladness. And then God inspired Isaiah to write, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in, the sound, in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. Already, Jesus, God, had inspired the, the prophets to look not only at, at the beginning, but to look at the end of, of, the, end of the mission of, of Jesus Christ, the mission of God, that there would be a new Jerusalem, and that God would be glad in his people. He would rejoice in his people. God would be... God would be our temple. When you look at the New Jerusalem, it's an amazing prophecy of joy, of hope, of, of no sin, of no problems at all. And then we have another prophecy in Isaiah, which is in Zechariah, which is very encouraging. And it reads, and many nations shall join themselves to the Lord on that day and shall be my people and I will dwell in your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And many nations will join themselves to the Lord on that day. You know, they saw through a mirror darkly just as we do we see more clearly because Jesus Christ has come to the earth. But they, realized, they, they understood through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that, you know, Jesus would come to the nations. And once they knew Jesus, they would, they would, they, they would gladly go to him because he is our hope. You know, as... 
the people in North America, the people in all countries, when we elect a new leader, there's great rejoicing, isn't it? There's great rejoicing for a little while because we, have, we place our hope in this man or woman that they will make things better in our nation. And we all cast our, we cast our expectations on that person. And invariably, that person always fails in one, one way or the other. So we give him a little chance. And if we don't like him a whole lot, then we oust him either through another election or through a coup. But there's never been a leader who does not disappoint, never a leader in our world who does not disappoint. And the promise is that, and, and the sure thing is that Jesus has come into the, the earth as God, God and man in, his, in himself, and he is the only leader that will not disappoint as we place our trust in him. Because he's going to get rid of all evil. He's going to get rid of taxes. He's going to get rid of wars. He's going to get rid of hatred. He's going to get rid of jealousies. Because we, we, because we have been given a new heart. And this heart will express itself in love for God and love for neighbor in a perfect way. No more pride. No more insulting one another, either being insulted or insulting other people. That will not happen anymore. And it will happen because Jesus said so. He is the truth. He is the life. And he's going to bring peace on the earth. And that's why we, we can certainly rejoice. It is important to, to be reminded as well and really to stress that Jesus is God. You know, after the, the incarnation or at the incarnation, he possessed perfectly within himself both the, the undivided nature of both God and man. The council, the council of Chalcedon, of Chalcedon in 451 AD, and I put that in the bulletin. Jesus Christ is to be recognized in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of nature is in no way annulled, annulled by the union. The characteristics of each nature, nature are to be considered at, as preserved and coming together to form one person and subsistence. They are not to be separated in two persons. Now, do we understand how that happens? We don't. God doesn't tell us how he is the Trinity. He just tells us that he is the Trinity. He just tells us that God, in his one nature, in his person, sorry, is both God and man. It's, it's, it's just beyond, it just blows our mind. We don't understand how, but we understand who. Who revealed this? Um, another important truth to remember is that God is one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Paul Molnar, in his book, Thomas uh, F. Torrance, Theologians of the Trinity, five great theologian series. He says, each and every doctrine depends upon the unbroken oneness of in being between Jesus and the Father and between the Holy Spirit and the Father. Read that again. Each and every doctrine depends upon the unbroken oneness of being between Jesus and his Father and between the Holy Spirit and the Father, and the Son. That there is one God who is triune, triune and he is one. You know, if we, if we would understand that perfectly, then 
we would probably make our own God. But it, it, it's a revelation that God is one. It's a revelation from God. We, there's no way we could have known that unless Jesus came from heaven to reveal who God is, who the Father is. So as we look at the birth of Jesus, we, we look at God being involved, the one God. You know, the Father did not stay behind because God is one. He's Jesus is, 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 is the eternal Son of God. And I won't try to explain it because I can't. And uh, we just know that that's how God has revealed himself. In Colossians 1.19, we read, For in him all the fullness of God has, was pleased to dwell. In Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And in Colossians 2.9, we read, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So the whole fullness of God dwells bodily in the human Jesus. That's what Colossians tells us. Do we understand the why? No. The how? No. But we understand, we accept based on faith. So we have all kinds of reasons to celebrate Christmas because the date outside and the various trappings are really not important. And I would like to share a few stories that you are acquainted with that shows the error of the Pharisees. Um, because the Pharisees saw the form, but they did not, they failed to see the essence. And you, you, are, you probably remember, and most of us are, and are aware of the story of the disciples picking grain on the Sabbath day. And Jesus healing a man with a withered hand. Now, the, the Pharisees were so ingrained in following the outside, the, the, the form of the Sabbath. You know, they had all kinds of laws, and they wanted to make sure that the Sabbath would be observed perfectly. So they devised all kinds of laws. And when Jesus came to, and he, he, he said to the disciples, you know, it's okay to pick grain on the Sabbath. It's okay to, uh, to heal because I'm the creator of the law. I'm not, I'm the one who devised the law. I'm not subservient to the law, although as a man, Jesus obeyed it perfectly for us. But the Pharisees got upset because they did not see the who. They just saw the what? Jesus breaking the Sabbath, their thoughts of the Sabbath. So they did not see that. They, they, could, they could not perceive. They were blinded to the fact that here before, standing before them, was the reality of the Sabbath, the rest of God, the R-E-S-T of God standing before them. They, 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 they stayed stuck in the shadow, in the shadow of the Sabbath day that was pointing to Jesus. And they became very condemning, didn't they? They just threw out Jesus. <laughs> That's what they did. So, and it's easy for any of us, to all of us, and we all fell in that trap. I did fall in that trap. You know, thinking that celebrating Christmas was not right. Because I thought in the past that it was a pagan holiday. And I thought, I thought all kinds of distorted things. And I missed out on many years of celebrating the birth of Jesus. And I felt pretty righteous about it as well. You know, I felt pretty good about that. You know, I felt that, you know, other people did not know what I knew. That Christmas was a pagan holiday. 
and we distorted Jeremiah and all these things. And probably some of you did the same thing as well, I would guess. But it's not only, sometimes we give other excuses. I don't celebrate Christmas because it's too commercialized. Because, and, and various other reasons that we can give. The focus is not on Christ. The focus is on Santa Claus or some other figure. Because, yeah, I, hate, I don't celebrate Christmas for that reason. Or it's been appropriated by, for, for some, it's been hijacked. And we miss the who. Does it really matter as God's people what ha what's happening in the world? Because we are told to come out of the world. <clears throat> what's important is that we celebrate the who. Celebrate the who of Jesus. We don't know the exact date when he came 2,000 years ago. I don't know if he came on December 25th or not. It really doesn't matter. It's a time that the church has chosen to celebrate the wonderful miracle of Jesus coming to the earth. To be one of us. To be Emmanuel. That is what is important. And not the other things. He was born to heal the rift that existed between God and humanity. And he was born to take away the sin of the world. That is, and what is the sin of the world? The sin of Adam and Eve. It's the rejection of God. The rejection of the authority of God. And Jesus came to live his life for us and to accept for us that God has authority. That God is a good God, that God is a graceful God, that God is a merciful God, that God is a loving God. That's how he describes himself. And he came to reveal that. And it was out of love that God the Father has sent his eternal Son to do this. So, why not rejoice? Why not celebrate together this wonderful birth? The son, of the son of God became the Son of Man so that we children of humanity might become children of God. It's called the Great Exchange. And uh, it's from Invitation to Theology by Michael Jenkins. But it's really what it's, it, that's what God came. The Son of God became the Son of Man, the Son of David, so that we children of humanity might become the children of God. It's a lot to think about, isn't it? God's love that he humbled himself to that level. And then we have, you know, the way God works basically is that you have the, the Father, you have the relationship of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you have the Holy Spirit that, and I don't know how it works, but I just know that that's what the Bible talks about, how God, how God is. But we know certain things that he's revealed, that the Son and the Father are united through the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is God, the Son is God. They're of one essence. And then through the Son, humanity is included in Jesus because... and because the Son came and identified with humanity. And so, and so humanity is included in that beautiful, loving relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the Son, Jesus Christ. And humanity has been born anew. Most of humanity doesn't know us, but it's still the fact that we... That is still the reality, and, and God is opening eyes little by little in his wonderful plan. And one day, nations will join and will accept this beautiful reality of who they are. Right now, humanity is living outside its identity. 
And as God's people, we are still very weak and God is very merciful, so he's transforming us in the image of his son. And already because Jesus represents all of us, we are we are we are we stand blameless before God. We already stand forgiven before God. That is the, the, the beauty of what Jesus has done. So it's there's a lot to celebrate, isn't it? And and the good news is that when we share with other people as God opens their eyes, is that hey, you're already forgiven. Accept that new life. Live that new life that you have and and as God's people, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's what God tells us. And, it's, and uh, James Torrance describes this as this movement of grace. It says, the relationship between the Father and Son through the, the, whole, the, the Spirit towards humanity that we just saw, and the relationship through Christ by the Holy Spirit, God relates to us. So... So we have this, this very presence. And uh, Calvin said, he said, For the Son of God became man in such a manner that he had God in common with us. And the reason why God is our God is that God is Christ. God whose members we are. So he became a completely human being. God the Father was his God when he lived on the earth as a man. And then, but the Son is also God. So as mediator, he's both God and man, representing us perfectly in the heavenlies. This is a wonderful gift of grace. That, and that's why, as human beings, you know, God, Jesus humanizes us. Because when we know we're forgiven, then we don't have to hide before God and I have problems, I have, I'm not perfect, and neither are you. I know that because we're still in the flesh and we still fight the, the battle of sin. But we can go before God and say, you know, God, that's the way I am. I have these battles because we know we are already accepted in the Son and forgiven. And we can be honest with, with ourselves and honest with God as we confess our sins. We don't want to sin. And so in our weakness, we, we, we do sin. But we have the Son who is our advocate. And in Him, we are completely forgiven. And in Him, we are the children of God as human beings. Not as God, but as human being in Jesus, the Son of David, who is a perfect human being standing in the heavenlies, having both nature in Himself of God and man. So, and Jesus, when he lived on the earth, he lived, he began his life, he lived his whole life for us. He became a little baby. He was born through the birth canal. He sucked, and he, from Mary's breast, he had to be changed. I'm sure they didn't have diapers then, but they had some other things. And he had to be changed. And he grew up and he had to be fed. And he grew up in puberty. And then he grew up as an adolescent. And then he grew up as a young man. And he was rejected and he died. He was baptized for us. He submitted to the law for us. He was circumcised. He suffered from, the, from the, the time he came to the earth to the time he died for us. And the final act of, uh, is that when he died on the cross and took the second, the second death on himself for us so that we wouldn't have to go through it. He became a curse for us. He became sin for us when he was not a curse and was never sinned. But he came all of that for us so that we can be united with, to God in him. So when we celebrate his birth, we celebrate a great event. 
we celebrate the liberation of humanity. <laughs> he came to give to make the captives free. And each and every one of us who was a captive, captive to darkness, and he came to rescue us. I'd just like to read to you what Jesus did from the Message Bible in Philippians 2. It says, think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God and didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantage of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privilege of deity and took on the status of a slave, became <coughs> human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him, honored him far beyond anyone and anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. That is why we celebrate the birth of Jesus. He is the source of joy. And you know what? We don't even have to manufacture this joy. We don't have to work it up. Because one of the fruit of the personality of God that dwells in us is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. The personality of God dwells in us. And what we are asked to do is to receive Jesus in our lives daily. Because he is the one who gives us joy as we trust in his faithfulness. He just asked, trust me, have faith in me. And he said to his disciples in Luke, in John 15, 10, he said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandment and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full and one day our joy will be full at the resurrection at his second coming it'll be full and right now we experience it partially as we receive joy and i'm sure god the father when jesus came to the earth and that day when he penetrated time and came to the earth the angels rejoice and I'm sure God the Father rejoiced as well because his greatest desire is to have you and I and every human being come to repentance and be included in this wonderful relationship of love. Let us pray. Father, we come before you so very grateful and so very thankful realizing that you give us everything because you give us yourself. And as we abide in you and you abide in us, your love is poured out in our hearts. Your joy is poured out in our hearts. Your peace is poured out in our hearts. Your gentleness is poured out in our hearts. Your persistence and long-suffering is, is poured out in our hearts because that is who you are and you have made us your temple and how wonderful that is I know father we don't understand this fully but we trust that it is so because you are you are transforming our lives and we are beginning to experience that wonderful joy and that wonderful peace of being in you we give you praise, we give you thanks, and thank you for inviting us to your table to have communion, to eat of you, and to drink of you, to take you in. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.